Hi, I'm Alistair. I'm a games designer. And normally in these videos, what I do is start by showing you a prop or a puzzle which I made for an escape room game, and then talk you through the hardware and the software so you can make it yourself. Now, this video is going to be slightly different because I haven't yet made the project which I'm going to talk about. In fact, I'm not even sure exactly what it's going to be yet. So rather than this being kind of a tutorial that you follow along with, this is going to be structured more like a kind of a development diary that sort of follows me through the process of hopefully building a escape room prop from scratch. So the reason for trying this new format out, well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that I've been making these videos for about three and a half years now, and I just thought I'd try something new. Um, the second reason is that I make these videos to be instructional. I want people to be able to follow along and to get the skills and the knowledge to be able to create these projects themselves. But when I show you something that I've already made, it's kind of easy to accidentally forget to mention things that I did or to miss out steps. And if I document everything as I go in kind of chronological order, then hopefully you'll be able to see that complete picture without me missing anything out. When you see some tutorials on the internet, you kind of see this um, perfect finished product and the steps that led there. And that's because it's been edited and they've kind of chopped out all the times that things went wrong or they made bad design decisions or, you know, they just broke things on the way. But that happens all the time. Every creator I know, every escape room designer, developer, software developer, fabricator, they make mistakes all the time. And to kind of show you a more honest picture of what it's like to design these things, I'm going to leave those things in. So as we go, um, there will probably be things I get wrong, there might be things I break, there might be things I create and then end up not using because we go in a different direction. I don't really know, but I think it's really important to show that those things happen and also what you do when you encounter those kind of errors, how you work around them or, or fix them. But what it does mean is that these videos will be um, perhaps slightly less structured than the ones I'm used to presenting. And if what you really want is kind of a step-by-step -step guide as to how to create a project, this probably won't be it. I will tell you now, this is going to be slightly more general, just like a holistic view of, of everything that's involved in creating an escape room tech project. If you just want the step-by-step -step guide, I recommend maybe wait until the end and I might uh, produce like a concise version of the actual version. But what I'm, I'm hoping this will show instead is this will be useful in other ways. Um, it might not be, it might be a disaster, I genuinely don't know. But we'll see how it goes and hopefully you'll come along with me. So the first thing we need to decide is what is it that we're actually going to make? And whenever I start a new project, there's kind of a, a couple of different factors which I consider. So the first one is what is it that other people want me to make? So it could be that I've got a client that's actually got a particular set of requirements. That's pretty explicit. Or it might be that one of my Patreon supporters has contacted me and said they'd really like to know how a particular component works or to have a prop that has a particular effect. But it could also be, you know, I'm a member of many Facebook groups and it might be that there have been conversation threads in those recently where it's obvious that there's kind of demand out there from people who want a particular project or prop. So those are all kind of things that other people want out there. And then there's also what is it that I want to make, which may or may not overlap with that other group there. It could be that I've played a game and I've went, well, you know, that was a really cool effect and I'd like to be able to recreate that myself. I'd like to figure out how it worked and, you know, do my own twist on it. Sometimes it's the case that actually you experience something that wasn't as good as it could have been. And you kind of think, well, that would have been great if they'd changed this bit or I would have done it this way instead. So there's kind of things that I'm interested in doing for my benefit as well. And then there's also, the set of things which I know how to do. <laughs> because it's all very well, there might be something that people want and it might be something that I want as well, but if I don't know or I won't be able to find out how to do it, then there's no good me taking it on. It's kind of important to know your limitations, I suppose. And for me, 
I, you know, my area of expertise is in software and electronic design. I am no good with physical fabrication or large scale mechanical props, for example. So, I mean, I would think it would be amazing to have like a full scale, I don't know, elevator unit that rattled or something like that. And maybe other people want that as well, but I'm not going to be the person to create that. And then finally, there's kind of what is it that I've actually got the materials and resources that means I'm going to be able to make it, um, particular in the current climate at the moment. Um, here in Britain, we're still in lockdown, obviously. It is a little bit harder to get hold of some materials that it used to be possible, seeing as we've now left the EU as well. Um, so, you know, what do I have to hand? What can I make use of if I'm trying to use reclaimed materials? If I've maybe just found something, I think, well, that'd be cool to make a puzzle out of that. And when you sort of combine all these things, and I thought, well, what have we got at the moment? Well, it's certainly the case that there are people talking about portable escape rooms at the moment. Um, as different countries come out of COVID, it seems like it might be a long time before we're going to have indoor escape rooms open here, but we can certainly have outdoor open uh, outdoor escape rooms and also um, kind of escape rooms that are delivered to a family. So a particular bubble are able to play and things like that. So portable escape rooms is definitely demand for that. And that's something I'm quite interested in as well. I like the idea of having a, a crate or a box or whatever form it is that's kind of a microcosm of a complete escape room game. But the thing that would interest me more about that actually is to have something modular. So rather than having uh, a crate that's sort of fixed and got all the components in it, I'd like to have something that is like an escape room. It's like a space into which I can place different components and have something that is configurable and, and you know, can change. And also, I guess, could be adapted for different settings, but still based on the same structure. So I really like this idea of a modular portable escape room game. Can I build one of these? Well, it uses quite a lot of similar technologies that I've already used in previous projects as well. And I'm fairly confident I'll be able to teach myself or find out the bits I need. And have I got the components for it? Well, obviously, I've got bunches of LEDs and motors and switches and pulleys and all these things as well. And I also have, ta -da, I found this in my loft recently. So this is an old flight case. Um, it's got nothing in it. I think it probably originally had some sort of remote control toy or maybe in it, I'm not sure. But now it's just an empty flight case. And kind of this combined with all those other factors kind of came together beautifully. So I thought, okay, what I'm going to make is I'm going to make a portable escape room game in this box. And I'm also going to design it in such a way so that different components can be added and removed from it easily um, to create a kind of a customizable game um, uh, that can be that can be used, you know, outside at festivals and events delivered to people's houses, things like that. Um, so that is what I am planning to create. Let's see how it goes. So I'd normally start by drawing out a rough sketch of the design on paper and pen or electronically. And when I say design, I mean both the kind of the physical layout and also the kind of the, the systems design. So uh, what components are going to be there and how they're going to be connected to each other. So I'll start off by drawing the rough outline of my box. It's about that dimensions there. And in the center, I'm imagining some kind of uh, central processing unit. Uh, this is going to be the brains behind the box, and this is going to kind of be a permanent feature. And then around the outside of that, I'm imagining these kind of uh, swappable modules, which can kind of be mixed and matched to create different behaviours, uh, different functionality to theme the game in different ways. And they'd kind of uh, be hot swappable into these different slots like this. So if you were to make an analogy with a regular escape room game, the, the central unit in the middle, this is the equivalent of your games master. And that would normally be running some kind of PC control software, for example, which is monitoring each of the individual slave puzzles around the outside. So these are all my slave devices. And you can think of these like standalone puzzles of the sort that I've demonstrated on this channel in the past. So this could be a connect the wires prop or a keypad prop or whatever it may be. 
And each of these is probably being powered by its own Arduino or uh, microprocessor. And in turn, what they're doing is they're connected via a network to the master device, which is controlling the overall state of the puzzle and sort of reading inputs and sending outputs back from them. Now, I've talked in the past about various kind of network interfaces. I've talked about SPI and I've talked about I squared C and they're generally used to connect sensors to a microprocessor. What we're doing here is actually connecting several microprocessors to each other. And to do that, I'm actually going to use a different infrastructure called PJON. So PJON is a system I've actually only heard about myself relatively recently. You can see the website at pjohn.org. And if I scroll down a bit, you can see the description says that it is an open source network protocol able to connect devices using uh, various media, and it's got a list of some of the devices that it works on. In fact, if I scroll down a little bit more, you can see it's actually got some nice icons of those devices. And this is something which I've actually been meaning to try out on a project. So this is a great example of where I'm hitting that uh, circle I showed at the beginning of projects that I want to do. You can see it has a single wire data link for up to 255 devices. And then if I scroll down to the bottom, uh, there's a link here that says, where can I get PJON? And that takes me to GitHub. So I'm just going to download the whole library. OK, so now what I want to do is build the, the absolute minimum required hardware to test whether that software library is going to work. So I just want something very easy to make and cheap and dirty. So I'm going to use a breadboard and just plug a nano into that like that and then to actually wire to the GPIO pins I'm going to use this screw terminal connector so rather than you know make a set of DuPont cables or anything like that I'm just going to plug this into the breadboard and you see this is a three terminal connector that means I can screw easily into a ground 5 volts and one of the GPIO pins A6 there so that's my first kind of slave module. Here I've got some nice silicon cable. This is stranded uh, 24AWG wire, which is my kind of wire of choice for um, wiring these kind of connections between devices. So I'm just going to get a rough idea of the distance to the next slave unit in the network. Slot another nano onto there. Take another screw terminal connector and just line it up with the same pins like that. OK, so this is the start of my network now. So now I'm just going to measure rough distance between them there. Um, now, by convention, I always use blue coloured cable for data lines. Um, you know, it, you don't have to do that, but I think it's very helpful, especially when you're debugging, to be consistent. Um, so I'm going to cut three equal length data lines there. And then I'm also going to cut the same length uh, cables for power and ground as well. So for that, I'm going to use black for ground. And then I'm going to use uh, red for positive 5 volts. There we go. So now what I need to do is I need to actually uh, connect these slave devices together. So to do that, I'm just going to take my wire strippers, strip a bit off the end of each wire. And this bit's probably going to get quite boring now, uh, so I'm just going to speed this up. OK, there we go. So now I've got all my cables stripped. Uh, I can actually wire them together. So I'm simply going to wire the 5 volt uh, from one slave device to the next, the ground from one slave device to the next, and also a single data line is going to connect them all as well because my understanding of the PJON network is that that is all required. Unlike SPI where you need um, you know, a master out and a slave in or I squared C where you need a clock line and a data line, this is literally just a single data line between all devices. So we're going to connect ground, power and data. And again this is probably going to get a bit dull so I will speed this up as well just to get all these wires connected. OK, and that's the last one just inserted there. So there we've got my three slave devices. Now in my design I actually had five slave devices, but I think having three will be sufficient to 
test whether this idea is going to work or not. Then I need the master device. Now for this, I'm going to use an Arduino Uno um, for no particular reason other than it actually helps me visually identify which device is the master of it to the slaves. So again, I'm just going to wire this up exactly the same way to 5 volt and ground and to the data line. Okay, there we go. So that is my very basic set of the network. And that's all that's required to carry signals. But now I need some way of triggering a message to actually be set between devices. So for here, here I've got some solid core cable. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect that to one of the other GPO pins on each Arduino. Uh, so let's go for um, one on this side of the board over here. And I'm just going to connect that to ground. So this is kind of simulating a very primitive um, push button switch, except rather than pushing anything to connect this uh, pin to ground, what I'm actually going to do is just pull this wire in and out like that. So this is going to be able to simulate whether I can send a message across the network from one of the slave devices to the master device. Actually, let's just re-pin those back in into pin D2 instead, like that, and on that side as well. That's probably a bit neater. Uh, I don't know why I tend to use pin 2 for uh, a button input. I'm not sure why, just conventionally again. And I'm also going to need a pin on the UNO, on the um, the master device, which is going to trigger a message that's sent to all the slaves as well. So imagine that could be like a, a ready message or a reset message going from the master to the slaves, and the slaves are going to have an input that they'll send back to the master. Now, already having done that, I've just realised a hey, cock up I've done, and I did say I was going to leave errors in to prove that anyone can do them, and indeed I have. So um, what I've just noticed is that these three pin connectors, which I've put at the bottom, connect to pin A6. Now, on an Arduino Nano, pin A6 is for an analog input only. Um, they don't even exist on the Uno. Uh, Uno is only going from A0 to A5. Nanos have A6 and A7 as well, but you can only use them as inputs. Now, that's going to not work on my network uh, because I need that network pin to be an input and an output. So, already, having not even got around to testing the hardware, I'm already going to change my design and I'm going to re-plug those data cables into one of the other pins. So I'm going to go into A0 instead. So I've just put some new screw terminals on there and I'm just going to move these wires across. But this is a really, really good example of why you want to use uh, breadboards or very quick this fail fast prototyping idea to spot any areas like this. I've also plugged that one in backwards, that's not going to help. Because if I'd have printed up a PCB already that was using that wrong pin, I'd have spent a lot of money and a lot of time and effort creating something that was useless. So breadboards are really handy just for pulling stuff out, trying it out, making it work, and making your design right. So I'm just going to correct all of these. Okay, there we go, that looks a bit better. And the Uno, that was fine anyway. So now I've got the data line going into A0 on all three slaves and the master. And I have a button uh, that is connected between two and ground on all the devices. Okay, so now we're gonna switch back to the software side of things again. And the Pidlon library, which I downloaded, comes with some uh, example code. And so I'm going to start with one of the examples, and it's called a software bit bang blink with response, which is a bit hard to say. And it has two different versions of the file. It has what it calls a transmitter code, which is this one here, and it also has a matching receiver code as well. And they sort of are going to correspond, roughly speaking, to the idea of my um, server and slave devices. So you see they're actually uh, pretty pretty similar. Um, the difference is that this one initially sends repeatedly a message over the network. It sends the character B to uh, a device with ID 44. And this one here listens to see whether it receives a B. And if it says, uh, if it does rather, it replies back with a B. So I'm gonna change that functionality 
uh, slightly to, to sort of match what I expect to happen. So my transmitter, this is going to be my my central control device. And so it's going to initialize with an ID and I'm going to give that something memorable. So I'm just going to call this ID 100. So just like on an I2C network, every device has to have a unique address and that's normally set in hardware. When you're using PJON, everything has to have a unique address as well, but you can specify that in software. So we're going to have our, our master device uh, is going to be referred to as ID100. And then in the setup function here, where we say strategy set pin 12, well, this is where we need to say what pin we're using to carry the data on the network. Remember, I ended up using pin A0 uh, both on the Arduino Uno and all of the slave devices as well. So that's there. Um, and I'm also going to add a little bit of just standard Arduino code here for that button we added. So that button is attached to pin 2. Uh, and I'm going to make that, oh, I can't type this even. I'm going to make that an input pull up. And then in our loop function here, what we're going to do is we're going to say if digital read two equals low. So that means if our, uh, well, it's not a button being pushed, but it's a wire that's connected to GPIO pin two. If that's touched to ground, which is our way of simulating a button push, that is where we want our master device to send a, a message to all of the slaves. So um, I'm going to copy the code here because the syntax is uh, very similar. I have to say the documentation for, for Python is actually really good. Um, so it didn't take me long to find out these commands at all. I've never used this before to point out. I've just been reading up the documentation just now is how I've learned to do this. Uh, so I don't want to send a message repeatedly there. Um, instead, only when that pin to is connected to ground, I'm going to send a message. Now. The first parameter here is who are we going to send a message to? This has got to be the ID of the device. So just as this is now device ID 100, well, I want to send a message to all the devices. So to do that, you put a zero there. Uh, what message are we going to send? We're going to send the character B, which is a single byte value. And then I don't need this bit on the end because that was when it was a send repeatedly message. I'm just going to chop that out there as well. Um, so that's all the change. Notice that again, because I'm just trying to set up a very, very quick proof of concept, I'm not going to spend a lot of time commenting stuff neatly or arranging it. I'm literally just trying to get something that works. And I think that will do it for the server. Then when I go to the receiver code here, um, so what I'm going to need to do is to assign a unique address for each slave. For some reason it comes up with the default as 44. I don't know what, why that is particularly, but I mean, you know, 44 is fine. And I will need to change that for each of the slave devices. So I could go 44, 45, 46, 47. Just as, um, you know, on any other network, you need to have some unique way of knowing what device you're sending information to and also where information has been received from as well. Uh, so the receiver function will keep that the same. So this is when it receives a character B, which it will do from the host, it's going to send a B back. But also, um, just as with the host here, when the button is pressed, let's come back over to this side. Um, but this time, we're not going to send it back to every device. We only want to send it back to the master. So we're going to send 100 here. Oops, sorry, I'm all over the shop with my typing there. There we go. Um, and I also need to make sure I include that pin mode here in the setup function and also change that to be a zero there as well. So here we've got our two versions of the code, which we've modified slightly from the very basic example. And what I've done is I've specified a unique ID for each device. 100 is going to be my master. My slaves are going to be 44, 45, 46. And I'm just going to change that before I upload them. And then what's going to happen in each one, basically you have exactly the same functionality. The only difference is that when the master button gets pressed, 
it sends a B to all the slaves. Uh, when the slave button gets pressed, it just sends a message back to the master. So that's going to test two-way communication, but also kind of broadcast uh, compared to specific device information. And then when either device receives a message, this is what's going to happen in the receiver function. It is simply going to blink the LED on and off and then send a reply. Okay, so let's try that code out. So now I simply need to upload that code onto my slave devices. So starting with this one at the end, see when I plug the USB cable in that all of the devices light up. That's because they're sharing those 5 volt and ground signals. And I'm just going to upload the first receiver code onto this device. So this will have the device ID 44. And you see the receive transmit lights flash on and that one is now programmed. We'll do is go on to the next slow device and then what I need to do is just remember to edit the code slightly to increase the address to uh, 45 for this device and then upload uh, that one and wait a few seconds and hopefully we'll see yep those LEDs start flashing so that's received light there and that one too is programmed okay okay so we'll now program our third slave device and this one is going to be device ID 46. Let's click to upload onto that one. There we go, fantastic. So that's all of our slave devices programmed with the receiver code or the modified receiver code. Now what I need to do is um, connect the uh, master device instead of the UNO, which obviously has got a different sort of USB socket, so I just need to wrestle with that for a moment. Oh, uh, it looks like the, oh, my Arduino UNO wants to go walkies for some reason. Let's just hold that down. Uh, so this one is going to have the modified version of the transmitter code, and this is going to be a device ID 100. So when we send this code and upload it to the board in theory uh, this will make our devices start oh okay so it's uploaded and we've got a kind of a disco going on oh i know what's happened so i have got the wires all plugged into ground already so when the code first fired up um, what was happening is that lots and lots of button presses were being registered there we go that's a bit better you can see the lights are calmed down now. So what I can do now is I can simulate a button press from the master device. So this should trigger all of the slaves. There we go. You can see all three slaves are triggering when I do that. And in fact, the they're sending a receipt back to the master device as well. So that's why the LED there is flashing afterwards. So it's sending lots of messages and then it's receiving a receipt back from them. Now let's try each slave individually. So let's try this one here. If I touch the wire here, here we go we can make the master device come on by sending from this slave um, let's try from slave 46 whose wire I just pulled out and threw on the floor uh, so plug that into digital pin 2 and to ground there we go brilliant yep that's working as well hey so this is this is pretty good I'm this is impressive I like this and there we go so we've got all three slave devices capable of sending a message to the master and the master is capable of broadcasting message to all the devices at once. Fantastic. That is our network infrastructure set up and tested.